Well, last week, we began by looking at the new creation and the new community and the new communion. We looked at how God is making all things new, new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem. And I think it's so interesting that God retains the name Jerusalem, holds on to it, and continues to use that, not just for Jerusalem today, but that there will be a new Jerusalem. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 6, he says, I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. If you've been around for a while at the bridge, you know that the three valleys that run through, that run, run through Jerusalem today form the equivalent of the letter Shem, the Hebrew letter Shem. If you were to fly over Jerusalem, you could see that, that Hebrew letter. And the letter Shem is for the Jewish people. It is the letter that represents the name of God. For Shem is representative of Shaddai from El Shaddai. And God Almighty. And so if you were to look at an aerial view of Jerusalem with the Kedron Valley on across the Hinnom Valley, and I forget the uh, third valley, I think it's the Valley of the Cheesemakers. Anyway, those three <laughs> valleys, you look at it, <laughs> and it, it makes that letter Shem, that my name might be there. And Jewish people who live there will say, yeah, God's name is right here in the city, even in that letter. Psalm 122, verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And then the Lord says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8, In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, whether they're united or not. All the nations that come against Jerusalem. The Lord has promised to protect Jerusalem. But he has not promised the same for those who come against it. And this is bad news for all those who do not choose to support and protect God's chosen city. But there's also very good news regarding Jerusalem, which we'll get to in just a second. Let's pray. Father, I ask, as we open up this book one more time tonight, that you will show us new Jerusalem. I thank you, Lord, that we have the pages of Revelation and, and that you saw fit to open John's eyes to give him this unveiling, this, this apocalypsis, Father, that we might know what's coming. As we talked about this morning, Lord, that we might have vision for the future, that we might walk today with a living hope for tomorrow. And Lord, as we walk through these things, again, write them on our hearts, cement them in our minds, Father, tuck them inside our hearts that we might live by them. And not only listen to these words, but heed them as well. And we pray for a blessing on this study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The good news regarding Jerusalem is simply this. Not only will Jerusalem survive and be rejuvenated in the millennial reign of Jesus, but as we began to see last week, and as I said a moment ago, the Lord has revealed blueprints in Revelation 21 and 22 for the new Jerusalem. Isaiah 65, 17, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Be, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. And I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. And as Jerusalem today remains the lightning rod of conflict in the world, we can know and we can take heart in the fact that New Jerusalem is coming. Now, a few things to jot down. We talked about New Jerusalem. We began to look at it last week. We're going to finish up looking at it tonight. But we need to understand, number one, that New Jerusalem is brand new. Remember, like the new heaven and the new earth, this is not a refurbishment. This is a completely brand new Jerusalem. It's not just something where it's fixed up for better curb appeal. This is an absolute new creation of the Lord. New Jerusalem is brand new. New Jerusalem, number two, is the bride of the Lamb. Because it's the place where the bride resides. It's the place where the church, it's the zip code of the church. It's that place that you are promised to reside in, in the new heaven, new earth, new creation. It's our hometown. 
New Jerusalem and the church are both the bride. It's not an either or. It's a both and. The gates of pearl, as we talked about last week, indicate Gentile believers. The twelve foundation stones of New Jerusalem bear the apostles' names. And New Jerusalem will again be our hometown. And I think that's awfully cool. So it's brand new. It's the bride of the Lamb. And New Jerusalem is also built on faithfulness. And I wanted to show you something we didn't see last week. You may recall that the walls of New Jerusalem, if you look in Revelation 21, verse 16, the walls of New Jerusalem are 216 feet high, 1,500 miles long for a total of 3 billion square miles. But listen to this note on the original measurement of this. You might recall that uh, we were told that the measurements in verse 17... Um, are according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. And I think that's just John's way of saying these measurements stand. But in verse 16 it says the city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles, and its length and width and height are equal. Now if you look at these measurements, the wall is 216 feet high, and the, the mileage around it, Measured 1,500 square miles. Now, if you look at those in the original language, what you see is 144,000 cubits for the walls. And the miles, the 1,500 miles, are actually 12,000 stadia. 144,000 cubits and 12,000 stadia are the measurements of New Jerusalem. Well, if you go back to Revelation chapter 7, just for a moment... Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, you hear something very interesting. John writes that he heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then he goes on to describe, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, and Gad, 12,000, and Asher, 12,000, Naphtali, 12,000, Manasseh, 12,000. You can follow it on through, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, all 12,000. So in the same way that the city measures 12,000 stadia, 12,000 from every tribe was sealed. In the same way that the city measures 144,000 cubits, There were 144,000 Jewish people who were sealed in that tribulation. What does it tell us? Simply this, that the dimensions of the new Jerusalem are the same as the number of the remnant of Israel that God will save. New Jerusalem is built on God's faithfulness. He does not forget his people. God will be faithful to his promises. Psalm 9 verse 11 tells us to sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds, for he requires blood. He who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. God is faithful. New Jerusalem is built on his promises. Number four, New Jerusalem is also bright. We read about the walls all around are formed of jasper, which would be diamonds. Twelve foundation stones are stunning precious pearls. The temple is God and the Lamb themselves. And New Jerusalem also bears one more characteristic note as we get into chapter 22. New Jerusalem is a beautiful garden city. It's a garden city. The city has a beautiful river. It has a beautiful tree. And it's a beautiful community. I want to look at that tonight. Revelation 22, verse 1, tells us, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. The river. This crystal clear, pure, unpolluted river that flows directly down the street of New Jerusalem. Sparklets, (laughs) Evian, these things are sewer water by, by comparison. This is a beautiful river. Three interesting properties of the river of life as an indication in, uh, in the Bible, what rivers indicate in the Bible. Number one, rivers in Scripture speak of pleasure. When the Bible talks about rivers, it's an indication of pleasure. Psalm 36, verse 8. They drink of their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. Psalm 46, verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. My friends, God created us for good things. 
and this river of the water of life that flows through the center of New Jerusalem will be a pleasurable thing. Rivers are a picture of pleasure in the Bible. Rivers also speak of prosperity in the Bible. Prosperity. Psalm 1 verse 1 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the seat of sinners, or, or stand in the path of the sinners, or sit in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In whatever he does, now listen to this, whatever he does, he prospers. Now the Bible tells us, the man who is planted in the word is like a tree planted by water, and he prospers because he's planted there. There is a prosperous promise for the person who is in the word who stands like a tree by rivers. What about this word prospers, though? I don't know about, about you, but, but for me, sometimes I hear the word prosper when applied to the gospel, and I get a little gun shy. I start thinking about what's gone around in our nation for so long now in, in recent years, the prosperity gospel. All you've got to do is name it and claim it. All you've got to do is have enough faith. If you have enough faith, you can prosper. You can be wealthy. You can be rich. And what does that say to the person who has great faith, but God has chosen to have them in a place of meager means? What about this whole prosperity gospel? Well, Isaiah chapter 48 verse 17 says the following. Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Prosperity. Profiting. True prosperity, according to the Lord, is what happens when you're in the Word. Your heart prospers. Your mind prospers. Your sense of the world around you prospers. You, are, you profit by being in the Word. Your well-being, he says, will be like a river, and your righteousness like, like the waves of the sea. There is a sense of prosperity that comes through the worship of, and, uh, and through the study of the Word that you can't get anywhere else. Now, one more thing, and keep thinking about this. The Lord is saying, Israel, my river of prosperity could have been yours. It still can be, for the river of New Jerusalem is a prosperous river. But rivers in the scripture, holding that thought of prosperity, rivers in the scripture speak of peace as well. I've got peace like a river, you know the old Sunday school song? Isaiah 48, 18 again says, If you had only paid attention to my commandments, then your well-being would have been like a river. Well, the word well-being there is shalom. You know what shalom means. It's peace. Your well-being, your peace, would have been like a river. And what is prosperity if it doesn't yield peace? We have... Um, just recently, Cheryl's parents got a couple of old waterfalls that they, they had packed away, and we have them up on our deck out in the back, and it's great. All night long, when we sit there, and we can just hear those, the water trickling out of the, into the barrels, and one's just like an old-fashioned pump, and all night, we just hear those things. Now, it took me a couple nights to get used to them. <laughs> found myself visiting the restroom more often, because, you know, you have that, that sound going, but once I got used to them, now it's great. It's very peaceful, and there's something peaceful, cool, relaxing, about the sound of, of water pouring. Well, Isaiah 66, verse 12, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream, and you will be nursed, and you will be comforted or carried on the hip and bottled on the knees as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. So prosperity, gang, is about peace. It's about well-being. And God promises that through the river that only comes through him, the river of life. Would you like to have peace like a river in your world? Would you like to be able to relax and settle in? This peace gang, so described in New Jerusalem, is available to you and I today. This kind of prosperity, and it's not necessarily a financial prosperity, although if God wants to bless you that way, so be it, he will. But that's not the prosperity the gospel points to. The prosperity of the gospel is peace. Jesus says in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Jesus doesn't give and take back. Jesus doesn't give something only to find out that once you've received it, it makes life harder for you. Jesus gives not like the world. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. 
Don't let it be fearful. You heard that I said to you, I will go away and I will come to you. And this river of life that flows through New Jerusalem hints at the source of true pleasure, true prosperity, and true peace, even today, that we can experience, that we can have. Because they all come from the same source. Have you noticed something? As we studied through New Jerusalem, someone is missing in New Jerusalem. We haven't seen this person mentioned in New Jerusalem. We've seen that the Father's there. We see clearly the presence of, of God the Father. We see very clearly the presence of Jesus the Lamb. But the Holy Spirit is not even mentioned. Where's the Holy Spirit? Turning your Bibles back to the book of Ezekiel, verse 30, uh, chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 and verse 22. Ezekiel writes and he says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name which you have profaned among the nations where you went. Now, let me give you a little um, side note about Israel. I talk about Israel a lot. Talk about supporting Israel, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, praying for the people of Israel, standing alongside Israel. But listen, it's not for the sake of the people of Israel. Not that there are bad people or good people. Hey, there are saints and sinners in Jerusalem just like there are here. There are saints and sinners in the Palestinian territories just like there are here. There are saints and sinners in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. We have brothers and sisters in Christ who happen to be Lebanese. Or who happen to be Syrian, who happen to be Arab, but they believe in Jesus. And they are brothers and sisters of ours. And there are Israelis who are Christians in the same way. It's not because the people of Israel just happen to be a really neat people that we're called to support them. The reality is that it's for God's holy name that we support Israel. We stand with Jerusalem because God stands for Jerusalem. We say we want peace in that city because it's God's city. And it's about Him. And he says, it's not for your sake, Israel, that I'm about to ask. It's not because, wow, over all these thousands of years, somehow the Jews have just lived a righteous life. <laughs> it's not it. It's because of the Lord. He says, I will vindicate, verse 23, the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. And we have watched that happen in this last generation. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of the stone, the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That is a beating, soft heart. And then he says, listen to this, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness. And I will call for grain and multiply it. Then I will not bring famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. And then... You will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded in your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. And they will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Real pleasure gain, rich prosperity, and restful peace come from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. As he says, I will put my spirit within you. And that's where these things come from. That's the flow, the picture that we see even in New Jerusalem of this river, the, the water of life, the picture of the Holy Spirit. 
John chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will, begin, will flow water, rivers of living water. And by this he spoke of the Spirit, John tells us, whom those who believed in him were to receive. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, Don't get drunk with wine, that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled up with the Spirit. And I think about how we laugh when we watch Pirates of the Caribbean and the Scallywags all in the second movie. I don't know if you saw it, but there's a point where, where they're trying to save the ship and they have to burn things and they have nothing left to burn but the rum. And he says, burn the rum. And all of them just kind of stand around looking shocked. Like, burn the rum? Not the rum. Don't burn the rum. We laugh about that, but gang, that stuff just burns the throat and distorts the mind, just as Satan attempts to burn and destroy the best of God. The contrast between the Spirit of God and what Satan offers in the world is so extreme, it should be obvious to us. God's gifts, like the river of life, the water that flows out of New Jerusalem, are free. God's gifts are freely given. Satan's counterfeits always come at a cost. Satan's counterfeits increase our craving while decreasing our satisfaction. But God's gifts, oh, as our craving increases, the satisfaction grows even deeper. And honestly, what we really crave more than anything else in life is the flow of the Holy Spirit. It's His Spirit within us that we thirst for, that we hunger after. The living water of the Spirit is graphically portrayed in the Millennial Kingdom and we'll also see it flowing freely in New Jerusalem, living waters in the heart of the city. Now listen to this, this is interesting. We read Zechariah, Zechariah 14 this morning, first eight verses. Well, verse 8 says the following, In that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. Now I want you to go ahead and flip back to Ezekiel, or if you're already there, turn over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. And while you're turning there, just listen up for a moment. Half of the living waters, Zechariah tells us, are going to flow to the western sea. What's that? Any guesses where the western sea is from Jerusalem? Who's got your geography? It's the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea. So the living water is going to flow out of New Jerusalem, or out of actually Jerusalem in the millennium, out of Jerusalem and over to the western sea. But the living water is also going to flow east to the sea which is to the east of Jerusalem. Do you know what sea that is? It's actually, it's the Dead Sea. It's the Dead Sea. Which right now, the Dead Sea is so saturated with salt that literally if you were to swim in the Dead Sea, and you can, if you visit Israel, you can float in the Dead Sea. It's a very cool experience, but you can't drink it. If you drink water from the Dead Sea, it can kill you. A woman had a couple swallows of it just about a year ago and was in the hospital for two weeks. Because it's 33% salt and minerals. That stuff that buoys you up, that, that help, allows people to float in the water, is deadly to you. And nothing lives. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Let me give you a clearer description. In the uh, International Standard, Standard Bible Encyclopedia, it says the following. The waters of the Dead Sea are impregnated to an excessive degree with saline matter. The salt which they contain, however, is not holy or even principally common salt, but is mostly the chloride and bromide of magnesium and calcium, so that they are not merely a strong brine, but rather resemble the mother liquors of a salt pan left after the common salt has crystallized out. They are deadly to drink. Packed with all these minerals. They're great to put on your hands if you're real soft. Great skin care. In fact, you can go and when you visit the Dead Sea, there's a store there. And you can buy all kinds of Dead Sea products for quite a bit of money. But gang, the waters are going to flow out of Jerusalem, this, this living water, into the Dead Sea. And something miraculous will happen there. Ezekiel 47. Listen to this. Verse 1. He brought me back to the door of the house, this is speaking of the temple, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east, and the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east, and behold, water was trickling from the south side. And then a man went out toward the east with a line in his hand. Now, this is very cool. Pay attention to this. He measured a thousand cubits and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand cubits and led me through the water, water reaching the knees. 
Again, he measured a thousand, and he led me through the water, water reaching the loins. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not ford, for the water had risen enough water to swim in, a river that could not be forded. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river were very many trees. On the one side and on the other. And then he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and go down into the Arabah. And then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea. And the waters of the sea become fresh. The Dead Sea gets freshened up. All that salt washed out until the Dead Sea is now a livable freshwater lake. <laughs> Incredible. Verse 9 says, it will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there and the others become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it. From En Gedi to Eneglium. Cheryl, you know where En Gedi is? We stood at En Gedi. En Gedi is the cleft of rocks where David hid from Solomon. And in that cleft of the rocks, if you turn your back to Engedi, to the west behind you, and you look out to the east, there's the Dead Sea. And there's a description of this water flowing down from Jerusalem, down through Engedi, and right on out to the Dead Sea. In fact, we weren't even supposed to walk into Engedi while we were there in January because there's a danger of flash flooding. If a sudden rain comes on, water comes right down through that canyon. And that's where it's going to flow. He says, from Engedi to Eneglium, and there will be a place for the spreading of nets. Now, if you look at the Dead Sea today, it is barren. There's nothing alive. Nothing could possibly live or survive in it. And yet there will be fishermen all around it, people spreading nets. And their fish will be according to their kinds, like the fish of the Great Sea. That would be the Mediterranean. Very many. It says, but its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. By the river on its bank, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They'll bear every month because the water flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. The water flows out of New Jerusalem. Now this is speaking again of the millennial kingdom. But in the same way, water will flow out of New Jerusalem and it will bring healing to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea teeming with new life in the millennium. And that's what God's grace does. That's what grace does. That's what the Spirit does in our lives. When the Spirit is poured into us, He washes out all that briny, dead, salty, crystallized stuff that clogs up our hearts. This living water of the Holy Spirit until suddenly our hearts are soft again and can beat again and are full of life. And the river in New Jerusalem, flip back there now, the river is real. But it also symbolizes the constant flow of God's living spirit for his people. Amazing. By the way, back in Ezekiel 47, just an afterthought. You notice how the river begins to flow and it flows ankle deep. And then it gets up to the knees, and then to the loins, and then it gets so deep you can't even swim in it. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. He starts out ankle deep. Enough for the new believer to begin to understand and see things differently. But the further we walk with God, the deeper we go. That river, that living water begins to flow up to the knees, and the loins, and the chest, and, and literally until it's just over our heads. Which is a good thing. Amen. The living water of the Spirit. Well... We're going to drink living water in New Jerusalem, but will we eat anything? Revelation 22, verse 2, tells us on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Good news. For those of you who like to eat, we will still eat in, on into eternity. I don't believe we're going to have to eat, but we can eat. There will be food available to us. It's funny because the first example we have of this is Jesus. After he was resurrected, he ate. Luke tells us that he ate a piece of broiled fish in the presence of the apostles, kind of to prove to them that he wasn't a ghost. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in my glorified flesh. I'm real. I'm tangible. Give me a piece of fruit I'll, or fish. I'll prove it to you. John recalls a particular post-resurrection breakfast with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. As Peter leapt out of the boat and swam to shore. Which, by the way, is a really funny scene to me. That's in John 21. And you know the scene where they're out there in the boat, and they're back to fishing because Peter's not sure what else to do, and Jesus appears on the shore, and they can't really recognize him at first, and he says, hey, cast your net out on the left side of the boat. 
It's like, well, we just cast on the right side. It didn't get anything. Well, cast on the left. Okay. They cast on the left, and they have a miraculous catch of fish, which is exactly how Jesus introduced himself to Peter in Luke chapter 5. And so at that sign, Peter realizes it's Jesus on the shore. He jumps off the boat, and he begins to swim to shore. Remember that? And he gets to shore right about the same time that the boat carrying James and John and the other guys get to shore. <laughs> Which I think is hilarious. And there's Jesus, and he has breakfast laid out. Come on over to the fire, bring the fish, let's eat together. In his glorified, resurrected body, Jesus was eating. And for someone like me, that's a comforting thought. I like to think that we're going to be able to eat. But what will we eat? Look closely at our sustenance. We eat the fruit of the tree. We're told that this tree of, the tree of life that grows here has 12 different kinds of fruit from the same tree that grow every month. One type of fruit each month, much better than the fruit of the month club. So much for the Harry and David, David catalog. I mean, you can just pick this right off the tree each month. It's different. But the tr- fruit of this tree is so much better because the fruit of this tree yields life. And as we eat this, we're invigorated. And as we eat this, we come alive. And the leaves of the tree, and this is interesting to me, the leaves of the tree are special leaves because they are for healing. They are for healing. Now, this is not the way little kids tend to think about things. Brian Regan, a comedian, talks about when he and his friends would be out riding bicycles and one of them would wipe out, the first thing all the kids would do is shout, get some leaves! You know, and they all become junior paramedics and try and patch them up with leaves. Well, these leaves really do heal. They are leaves for healing. How exactly does that work? And why would we need healing in heaven? That's an interesting thought. Why exactly would we need healing if we're in a place where we're supposed to be eternal? Why do we need leaves for healing? The word healing here in the Greek is therapia. It's where we get the word therapy. And it doesn't mean healing from sickness. It doesn't mean, oh, you you got a bad cold, go get some leaves off the tree. Oh, you broke your arm, wrap it up in the leaves from the tree. Oh, you got a headache, rub some of the leaves of the tree on your head. That's not what it means at all. It's therapia, and it means maintenance of health. It means, it's, it's like taking vitamins, it's exhilaration, it's invigoration, like taking all natural super vitamins, these leaves of healing are leaves of therapia. Now contrast that with what Satan offers in the tribulation period, and that's pharmakia, drugs. They're the all natural leaves of therapy from God that keep us fresh and invigorated. And then there's the pharmakia of Satan, which are just drugs, which mask and hide the real problem. I was watching MSNBC this last week and they were doing some uh, special expose on kids who were living on the street. Um, kids who are totally wasted on drugs. It was really, it was a, a tragic um, special to watch. Kids who are living on Skid Row and they're literally moving from one rush to the next, from one high to the next. They wake up in the morning, they go find, and they basically beg all day long, get together just enough money to have something to eat, to buy more heroin, and then to go shoot up that night. And I was thinking, that's, that's Satan. That's what he does. He, he brings drugs that will give a rush and make you feel energized and invincible and even powerful. But pharmacia always leaves us in a stupor. It never works the long term. It always brings them down hard. And, and to watch these kids' lives that are absolutely destroyed, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids who are chasing after the counterfeit of Satan, the pharmacia, as opposed to the therapy of God that maintains health, that keeps us fresh, that keeps us alive. The leaves of the tree are therapy meaning eternal health. And it tells us in verse 3 going on that there will no longer be any curse. That draws us all the way back to the great loss of the original tree of life, which was lost because of the curse. There is no longer any curse. Now you may recall there were two trees in the Garden of Eden. There was a tree of life, and there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were cursed. They were allowed to eat of the tree of life. Adam and Eve could have eaten of the tree of life forever, literally. God had it set up that way. They could have been eternal in the Garden of Eden had they just eaten from that tree and not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if given the choice, wouldn't you always rather eat the tree of life? Think about this. There is a time when knowledge of good and evil will literally become obsolete. The tree of life is found again right here in New Jerusalem. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is absent because it's unnecessary. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 that love never fails. But where there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. 
If there are tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. We talk a lot about spiritual gifts, and we think about the gifts in our lives and how they can be used. Gifts of prophecy and, and, and a word of knowledge. And the gifts of, of wisdom and, and all the different gifts of speaking in tongues. And gang, they will be gone. They're not going to exist. Why? Because we won't need them. We won't have any use for them anymore. We won't need the knowledge of good because the Spirit of God permeates the entire new creation and God himself is the light. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, They will not teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And that's why, by the way, if you were here this morning, that's why I said, I'm not praying for revival in the church. I'm praying for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm not praying that we get caught up with a lot of the spiritual gifts. I want us to have the gifts. And Paul said that. He said, I want you to have the gifts. Don't get me wrong. I want you to be able to prophesy. I want you to be able to speak in tongues. I want you to be able to do all these things. Those are all great things. But how much more? Not even to need any of that stuff because we have the Lord. We're there with Him. We don't need it because we're in His presence. That's... That's ultimately what we're looking for. Not to say again that the gifts are not necessary. In this life they are very necessary. Because we are short-sighted. Because we don't have all knowledge. And so there is a time when these gifts are so important that we would know and understand the will of God better. But man, how much better just to be with Him and go, Hey, Father, what about this? Jesus, can you explain this? We won't go around to each other saying, hey, listen, this is what the Lord has for you today. You know, the, the Lord has a word for you, Spence. And he just told me, to, no, because the Lord's right there. I'll just say, hey, Spencer, God wants you. <laughs> go talk to him. And as far as the knowledge of evil goes, we'll finally be free from that forever. Won't that be great? No more knowledge of it. Not even an awareness of evil. I, I, I've shared this before. I took a... I, had a, I have a degree in psychology, which I don't talk about a lot because it's really not that valuable as far as I'm concerned. But this degree, one of the classes that I had to take in my degree program was called Human Sexual Dysfunction. That was a fun one. Part of what was required in this class was the viewing of videos. And these videos were different types of people making love. Now, this is a secular college, obviously. And I timed it just right so that I was absent every day they showed one of those videos. It was great. Because I just I didn't need to see. I've got a vivid imagination. I didn't need any help. And so I showed up one day and unfortunately I missed it by a week. And uh, the, I don't know, the video camera wasn't working the week before so she held off. And it was supposed to be a video of a homosexual couple doing what they do. And so I sat there and I thought... And I had a witness as a Christian in this class among these other people. And I've been working so hard not to come across as all self-righteous or anything else, but just to be real and to be able to present Jesus in a real way. And so I thought, okay, if I walk out of this class, that'll make a statement. But if I watch this, that'll make a statement that's not right either. What do I do? And so I just bowed my head and closed my eyes. The lights went out, the video went up, and I closed my eyes. And, and I started hearing what was going on, so I started singing, you know, you know, it's a small world, different things, but Jesus loves me. I'm singing these songs in my head just so that I'm not listening or watching what's going on. Twenty minutes later, the lights go up, and the girl sitting beside me, who was just obnoxious, her name was Cindy, I'll never forget this, she goes, you're a homophobe, aren't you? Now, this is a small class, a graduate school class of 12 people, and she goes, you're a homophobe, and everybody looks at me and looks at her, and she goes, he closed his eyes through the whole thing, I saw him, he wouldn't even watch it. And so I said, well, I didn't need to watch it. And the teacher was like, well, Rick, why did you feel it necessary not to watch this video with the rest of the class? I said, because I've got an active and vivid imagination. <laughs> I don't need to see what you presented today. I'm aware of it. I don't want to be aware of it, but I am. And just as your reactions indicate, you know exactly what was on that film. Our minds can conceive of evil in this world. And won't it be great when we can't? When we can no longer even have the thought. It can't even, we just don't, it's not even a thought. It's just gone. Not just 
the tree of the knowledge of good, the tree of the knowledge of evil, completely gone forever. Well, I'll tell you more about that story another time, but it was an interesting conversation. Well, it tells us the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in New Jerusalem. And His bondservants, they will serve Him. And they will see His face. That's new. They will see His face. We will see Him. John says we will see Him because we will be like Him. We'll see His face. Well, no one can see, see God's face and live. That's right. But we will be, we'll be past this human body. We'll be eternal. We will be able to, for the first time, see God's face. We'll be able to do what Moses was unable to do on the mountain at Mount Sinai. God said, the best you can do is hide in that cleft and I'll cover you up and I'm going to pass by and you can see me trailing off. I think you can survive that, Moses. Anything more and you're a dead man. We will see his face. There are several things we get to do in heaven, by the way. Number one, we get to serve. We get to serve. It says his bond servants will serve him. Someone has actually said, and you've probably heard this quote before, I'd rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. It's the stupidest thing anybody could possibly ever say. Nobody rules in hell. There's no chain of command. From Satan himself to the last person to reject Jesus on earth, everybody there will be in torment. But gang, listen to this, serving in heaven will be an absolute pleasure. That will be a joy to be able to serve the Lord as literally a bondservant of the Lord. We're going to be like the prodigal son. The prodigal son who took his inheritance and wasted it, but when he came back to his father's house to serve, to get a job, because at least he could survive there, his father puts the ring on his finger and the, the new sandals on his feet and the robe on his shoulders, and he kills the fatted calf, and he says, my son is home. And to serve in the household of the father, that, that is a pleasure, and we get to serve there. The prodigals that we are back finally in our father's house. And as I said, we get to see his face we get to see his face, the face of our Father. Moses asked to see it in the Old Testament. God said, you can't. Philip asked to see the face of God in the New Testament. He said, show us the Father. And what did Jesus say to him? Philip, how long have I been with you? You don't recognize me yet? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And I think about this idea of seeing the Father a little girl, Cheryl, and I knew in youth ministry in California who had never known her father. And she was obsessed with seeing him. She just wanted to see what he looked like. She just wanted to talk to him. Her parents had been divorced when she was a very little girl and she had not seen her father her whole life. And it, it literally dictated everything that she thought about. She ended up having three children, I believe, out of wedlock because she so much wanted the love of a man. She wanted the love of her father. Well, we're going to have it in New Jerusalem. We're going to see his face. And we will be satisfied. Psalm 17, 15 says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. And why will I be satisfied? Because again, John in 1 John 3, 2 says, We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So we get to serve, and we get to see his face, and we get the seal of his name. We will all bear the name of Jesus Christ on our foreheads, and we'll see his name on everybody else. And that's probably the best thing about it. Check that out. There, his name will be on their foreheads. Well, that doesn't do you any good unless you have a mirror. That's the only time you're going to recognize the name on your own forehead. But what will happen is we'll see Jesus' name on everybody else's face. You'll run into someone and you'll see Jesus right across the forehead. And I think, man, that's not a bad idea today. Maybe we should all go out and get little Jesus tattoos on our foreheads. Right there. Because then we would know. Then we would never be in that situation where we're talking to someone who we've just met or maybe we're unfamiliar with or, I don't know, maybe you're in an accident on the side of the road and you're just yelling at the other person and neither one of you knows that you're both Christians. <laughs> that might change the conversation a little bit. Or even for us who know of each other as Christians, maybe we would treat each other differently if every now and then we were reminded that we're both children of God. Jim's a child of God as I am. And if every time I looked at Jim in the face, if I saw on him Jesus rather than jerk, which I don't see, <laughs> by the way, 
But those little idiosyncrasies about each other, those things that, and I'm not talking about Jim now. Let's separate that out, that example there. But those things about each of us that from time to time would annoy, if you saw Jesus on someone's face, wouldn't that make it all different? I just need reminding that I am in the body of Christ here. And that even if someone wrongs me, they're still one of his own. And even if I happen to wrong one of you, would you do me a favor and remember that I happen to be his child too? That I'm one of his own? We will see the seal of his name on our foreheads. And we will realize that we are all loved and forgiven and graced. And finally, we will see the light. We will see the light. The light will be his light. It's there. Verse 5 again tells us there will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. First John 5 tells us this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so all the warmth and illumination will come from the Father himself in New Jerusalem who so many thousands of years ago declared in Genesis 1.3 let there be light, and there was light. Let there be light. Why was there light? Because God is light. God himself is light. And New Jerusalem, gang, it's going to be absolutely awesome. We come now to the final words of Revelation. The closing of the book. We have seen the new heaven and the new earth. We have seen new Jerusalem in all its glory. We have a picture. Gang, you have a picture now. And I told you this about three weeks ago. You don't have to look at heaven as this vague, hard to describe thing that's out there. And we, we don't think about it because we don't know what it's going to look like. No, you know. Revelation 21 and 22 give us an apt description, a very specific description of what the new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem in between will be like. And how we'll live there. And what we'll eat there. And what the water will be like. All of that. That vivid picture. And I have that picture in my head now when I think about eternity. This concept of the place to which I'm going. It's a vision that the Lord has given us. But after all of this, John comes down to the last few verses. And speaking with Jesus and speaking with the angel, here's what's said. Verse 6, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. This is not the stuff of fairy tale and fantasy. It is all true. He says the God of the spirits of the prophets. You remember them. The guys who wrote the Bible. Who wrote down by the Holy Spirit the things that would happen before they happened. And now the Bible's telling us, John is telling us that they have all come true, or, or they will come true. At this point, the words are faithful and true because they will have all finally happened. And so the angel says to John, you can write this down, John, because it's fact. Now we're reminded of a, of a soon problem here. Because again it says, the angel is showing his bond service, the things which must soon take place. And so I take you all the way back to our very first lesson in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, that tells us the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Soon? That was 2,000 years ago. How can they soon take place? Well, let me remind you that the word soon here, both here in Revelation 22 and in Revelation 1, is in taxi in the Greek, like being in a taxi. In taxi, and it means suddenness. It means revving up. And once these things begin to happen, as John was told, as the end begins to happen, it's going to speed up with great rapidity. And things will happen very quickly. In fact, these things already began happening as John was writing down the revelation. As he was receiving the revelation, it had already started. What do you mean? Where was John when he received the revelation? He was on Patmos. What was going on historically at the time that John was on Patmos? Do you remember around the, the dating of Revelation? Persecution of the, church. Persecution of the early church. Anyone know what the, remember what the dating was in that? Somewhere about 95 A.D. The church age was already rolling. Described in Revelation, and when the angel told John at the beginning, or Jesus said, hey, these things are what are going to soon take place. They were already taking place. John was already 35 years, 65 years into the church age. It was already happening. 
and things began to roll along at a certain pace and we can count it over the last 2,000 years if you look things have sped up more and more and more the further down the line we've gotten there's a long time there where things were just kind of rolling along. The taxi was going, you know, 35 miles an hour through the town or so. And then we get about to the 1800s, and as we talked about so much recently, things started happening. People, Jews, started going back to Israel. It became a nation again. Suddenly, prophetic things talked about in Scripture began happening in this most recent generation. And what's going on? It's speeding up, gang. It's revving up in taxi. These things must soon take place. Now, for you skeptics, a couple of things to consider. We consider how fast the last 2,000 years have gone by, and we are already right now on the precipice of the end. I had one guy come up to me today and say, you know, the end is a negative concept. And I said, not if you're talking about the end of cancer. <laughs> That's a good thing. The end of a bad situation, the end of a long illness, the end of a broken bone, the end, I mean, you can go on and on. The end is a very good thing when the stuff that came before the end was filled with bad things. So I do like saying the end times because I want an end to so much of what's going on in the world today. Why are we excited by prophecy when other generations seem silent on the subject? Because for centuries, so much of this made no sense. It makes sense in this generation, doesn't it? Daniel was told, seal up the prophecy of your book. Seal it up tight. It's not for this generation. It will be unsealed at a later time. And gang, if you go back now and look at history and study the book of Daniel, the book has been unsealed. It is understandable. We are in that time of the end. Prophetic knowledge itself has increased exponentially in the last 50 years. We understand things now about the book of Revelation and biblical prophecy that was not understood 100 years ago. Things are revving up. Things are speeding up. And the events of this very generation that we are in indicate that we are in the taxi. And the tachometer, which is where we get that word tachometer from, in taxi in the Greek, it's revving up. Now this statement also indicates that once the tribulation itself begins, all these things will happen quickly. Boom, 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 one right after the other. Very fast. Verse 7. Verse 7 going on says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I find that interesting. This is a reaffirmation of the blessing. It's recalling the blessing that was given at the beginning of Revelation again. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Have you been blessed in the study of this book? Amen. I love this book. What an incredible blessing to walk through it and to see these things and to understand it. Have you been blessed in reading it and hearing it? I'm torn tonight. I'm always like this when I get to the end of the book, but, but especially the end of Revelation. I, I'm so torn. I want to just draw it out. <laughs> I want to keep you here a long time. <laughs> We'll get to the next verse in a few minutes. <laughs> Just want to savor it and hang on to it and move slowly with it because we know it brings a great blessing. But listen to this. The blessing is different here than it was in chapter 1. In chapter 1 it says, Blessed is he who hears and he who reads and he who heeds the prophecy of this book. Hearing and reading, you've already done that. Now we're told, Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. The focus here is only on heeding. You've read it, you've heard it, now heed it. J. Vernon McGee says this is a book not merely to satisfy the curiosity of the natural man, but to live and act upon. Take what you know, what you understand, and you live it out. You heed these things now. You live your life with the knowledge of what you've learned, what you've heard, what you've read. Heed these things. If you've been blessed by this revelation, Gang, there are two ways that you can heed the things written in this book. There are probably many more, but I just could come up with two. I have a very limited, you know. Two ways. Number one, live the blessing that you've received. Live the blessing every day to the coming of Jesus Christ. Well, how exactly do I do that? Look at verse 8. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshipped. At the feet, or I fell down to worship, at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. But he said to me, do not do that. 
Don't you get it, John? He did the same thing back in chapter 19. He got so excited, he just had to worship. So he fell down at the feet of the angel. He said, stop it, John. Knock it off. My uh, translation there. Do not do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, of the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book. John, you worship God. The best way to live the blessing, to heed the words of the prophecy of this book, is to live a life that worships God. Where you are walking in your worship. You are living in your worship. Look back at Revelation 19 real quick. And verse 10. The key verse, I believe, personally, of the entire book of Revelation is Revelation 19.10. Where John fell at his feet to worship him and he said to me, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. And he says, worship God. And here's the key verse. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This book is about Jesus. This book is not, as I've said before, revelations. It's the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ. This book is about knowing Jesus. This book is about seeing Jesus. And to heed the words written in this book means that you live your life for Jesus in every way possible. That he is first and foremost on your mind. You wake up in the morning and you say, good morning, Jesus. And you go to bed at night and you say, good night, Lord Jesus. And through the day you're saying, Lord, who do you have for me today? Who can I say the name Jesus to today? That is living the blessing of revelation. That we worship him, praise him, fix our eyes on him for he is our Savior and our God. Back in 22, verse 10 going on. Now he says, unlike what he said to Daniel, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So the second thing you can do, the second way to heed the blessing of this book, first is to live the blessing, but secondly, share the blessing. Don't even think about sealing up this book. You're going to close this book in a few minutes and walk out of here tonight. Close it, but don't seal it. Don't seal up what you've learned. Don't tuck it away to consider over long amounts of time. Share the blessing. It is a direct command from heaven regarding the book of Revelation, and you've just heard it. Do not seal up the words. Don't stop thinking about this. Don't stop talking about it. Don't seal the words. It's a clear message for those who would say that the book of Revelation are hard to understand. Well, you understand it now. It's been opened. Don't seal it up. It's a clear divine command to pastors who refuse to teach this book in their fellowships. To believers who stop reading the Bible at the end of Jude. <laughs> To anyone who says the world is random, that there's no end in sight, or that this world might be as good as it gets, don't seal up this book. You share the blessing. Don't dare seal it and close it and keep it away from the world. Chuck Missler says, if I had to choose one book of the Bible to teach a brand new believer, it would be the book of Revelation. It's the last book in the world I want to tell somebody about. It's just too big. It's not too big. It's the glory. It's the vision. It's the future. It's Jesus. And it is the book to take people to. And I'll tell you, you want to freak someone out and save them at the same time? Say, listen, let's just sit down and read Revelation together. <laughs> Serious, let me show you Revelation because in the first chapter they see Jesus. In the first chapter they see a glorified, awesome God. And from there it just gets better and better. Don't seal it up. Paul, Paul when he went to the, to the city of Thessalonica to plant a church... It's interesting. The Bible tells us that he was there three Sabbaths. So at the outset, if you put the three Sabbaths in the middle, he was there four weeks. Probably three to four weeks total, and he planted a church. And that blows my mind. And I've asked myself the question, and in studying First and Second Thessalonians in the past, I said, you know, how in the world could a man plant a church in three weeks, go away, and the church survives even better than that? It thrives. Well, we find that out because when Paul writes back to the church a year later, the letter of First Thessalonians, it's all about Bible prophecy. In fact, it's all about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church. And as he's writing these things, he's saying, you remember what I taught you while I was there? What was Paul teaching in those three short weeks he was in Thessalonica as he planted a church? He was teaching Revelation. 
He was teaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. He was teaching the rapture of the church. All these wonderful prophetic things that we think are for the more mature believer, Paul planted a church with them. That's amazing. And it bears out this important truth. Do not seal up the words of this book. I challenge you to wade, as Ezekiel prophesied, loin deep in the living water of the Holy Spirit with the hope of reproducing new believers in Christ. Go deep with the Spirit and don't seal up the words of this book. Verse 11. And this is an interesting verse. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who is filthy, still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous, still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy, still keep himself holy. What does this mean? John's saying, look, if you listen to, and you read the prophecy of this book, and you're still choosing to live in a life of sin, then live in that life of sin. Don't be wishy-washy about it. John's saying, make your choice. You know what's happening. You know what's coming. Make your choice and live it. Jesus said, I don't, I don't want you to be you know, lukewarm. I would that you're either hot or cold, Laodicea. But you're neither hot nor cold. You're neither frigid to me or burning up with passionate desire. You're neither one. You're just lukewarm, tepid water. And because that's what you are, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And John comes down to the end and he's writing this. And he's told, let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Hey, if you're going to hear this and still rebel against the Lord, man, rebel big. Make your choice and stand by it. However, if you're going to hear this and practice righteousness and attempt to be holy before the Lord, then you stick to it. You stick with that choice. Stand by it. Because if all these things can't convince you to rush headlong into the open arms of a loving Jesus Christ, nothing else will. Nothing else is going to convince you now. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming, Jesus now speaking, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Wash their robes how? Revelation 7.14 says these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's what you've done if you've given your life to Jesus. Your robes are washed white and clean by His blood. 1 John 1.7 tells us If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Now we've looked at these verses quite a bit over our study. I'm not going to dwell on them long, but just a reminder. Verse 12 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. This does not, gang, it does not speak of deeds-based righteousness. We understand And the New Testament is clear that we are saved by grace. So then how does Jesus say, my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done? He's going to render rewards. That's what he's talking about here. I'm coming with my bag of rewards, my gifts for you. And based on how you've lived your life in me, I'm going to reward you. This is not a statement at this point of condemnation. Remember, condemnation has already happened at the white throne judgment in Revelation 20, two chapters ago. If you want to live by the deeds, that buys you nothing but eternity in hell. But now, after all that, Jesus is saying, Oh, I'm bringing my reward. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning of the end. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds like he's making himself equal to God. Absolutely right. I'm glad you're sharp tonight. You didn't miss that. Verse 15. Outside... Outside are the dogs, and the sorcerers, and the immoral persons, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. Now wait a minute. Outside? Weren't we just talking about New Jerusalem? So are all these people going to be outside New Jerusalem? I thought everything was supposed to be perfect at this point. Outside here doesn't refer to being outside the gates of New Jerusalem. It refers to being outside the entire new creation. 
to being outside of the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Everything outside of it, this it refers to what Jesus called in Matthew 22:13, Matthew 25:30, the outer darkness outside of the presence of God the Father. Outside of the person of Jesus the Son. And apparently, all dogs do not go to heaven. Because verse 15 says the dogs are out there. Dogs, by the way, dogs, by the way, in the ancient world, and don't go home and tell your small ones this, you know, Hayden still prays that our last dog, Rudy, is having a good time in heaven, and I just can't break his heart. Buddy, you know, Revelation 22, 15 says the dogs ain't there. But I'm not going to say that to him. Let him continue in that delusion just a little bit longer. But dogs in the ancient world, and there's a reason that I believe this word is used here. It's not just a euphemism. Dogs in the ancient world were considered unclean and impure. They didn't run around the homes in cute little, you know, collars with the little bells and little bows in their hair. And, you know, we take them to the little groomer. They didn't do that back in Jesus' day. The dogs were unclean. Kind of like the coyotes who nose through our trash just about every night. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> we wake up in the morning, both trash cans are on the side. The trash is strewn out all over the, the property there where the coyotes have had a field day. And I guess the only thing stupider than the coyotes is me for continuing to put the trash outside. We've got to figure out a different way to deal with this. Because it's been you know, several weeks that they keep doing that. But that gang, that's what religion does. That's what religion does. And that's why the dogs are outside. Because dogs being unclean are also a picture of religion. Jesus used the phrase referring to pharisaical thinking. Paul in Philippians 3.2 said, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and in the glory of Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. And Paul, in this point of the Philippian letter, is writing about the Judaizers. He's writing about those who would put their focus in man-made righteousness. And he says they're dogs for doing it. They're like coyotes nosing through the trash, trying to get a morsel. And when a life of faith becomes burdened with the weight of works, there's only one question truly to be asked. Who let the dogs out? I had to say it. Let's roll on. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. This is awesome. A power-packed verse right here. He's both the root of David. In other words, David came from him, which speaks of Christ in eternity. And he's the descendant of David. In other words, he came from David which is the Jesus of humanity. David came from me, I'm his root, but I descend from him as well. Jesus is on both sides of the equation, the Christ of eternity, the Jesus of humanity. Verse 17, great verse, the Spirit and the bride say come. Why does the Spirit and the bride say come together? Because the bride is only the bride because the Spirit resides in and among us and with us. We are only the church and we are only righteous because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And the blood of Jesus that watched us. And so, so the Spirit and the Bride together, they say, come. And let the one who hears, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Spirit at work in the Bride, the church, both together saying, come, come. And I want to encourage you all not to be dismayed by the negative Human, fleshly things that we see coming out of the church today. Don't let that bum you out. Because as of right now, the Spirit is still at work in the church. And the Spirit is still alive among us. And though we may sin, and though we may live in the flesh, and though we may turn each other away, hey, the Spirit's still there calling us to unity. There is goodness in the church because the Spirit is residing there. And this is the work of the church. It's the work of the Spirit. It's one word. It's to say to people, come. Come. This is the final and ultimate action, by the way, of the person who heeds this book, who lives the blessing and shares the blessing. It's the person who would say to a friend, a family member, Come. Isaiah 118, Come, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Isaiah 55, verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. That's a funny phrase. You who have no money, come buy and eat. You don't have any money. That's okay. Come eat. Show up. 
says, come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, the Lord says, and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Come and eat. Come and drink. Not with things money can buy. This is so much better. John 7:37 again Jesus said if anyone's thirsty let him come to me and drink. Matthew 11:28 Jesus said come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come. Come to me. This is always the invitation of the Lord. This is what's on God's heart. It's what he says to anybody who's standing in rebellion, who's standing outside with the dogs in the darkness. God says come on. The doors are wide open, and I love the summertime here in the barn because we open both of the big barn doors, and I just love the, the, the sense of that. There's plenty of room. Come in. Come on. Come be a part of what the Lord is doing. By the way, there are a couple of times in Scripture where Jesus rarely did not say come. Instead, he said, go. He said, go. Matthew 19:21. he said to the rich young man, go. And sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. In Mark 5.18, to the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, he said, go home, go to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed and you've probably seen this before when Jesus went back to that region later in the book of Mark. We see how all of a sudden people come from everywhere to see this Jesus. Because the guy went when Jesus commanded, go. And in Matthew 28:18 through 20, to all his disciples, both then and now, Jesus has said, go. Go say come. That's the phrase. Go say come. Go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And gang, that's, that's how we get ready for the wedding feast. That's the preparation of the bride, to be those who are going. And all we need to do is go with one word on our lips, come. Now Jerusalem... Jerusalem today, where we began tonight, is causing trembling in the world. And maybe you personally are trembling in your world, and if so, come. Come to a life lived heeding the prophecy of this book. What is that prophecy again? Revelation 19.10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And Jesus is on the way going on it says I testify verse 18 to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book if anyone adds to them God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book so important so important are the words of Jesus here we don't need to add a thing, nor do we dare subtract a thing. All we need to do is share a single word. We just say, come, come, come. And verse 20 tells us, he who testifies to these things, see I'm slowing down, I want to draw this out. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And now as we come down to the last verse of our study, the last line of Jesus' revelation, we get to the last verse of the Bible. And one final note, when you read through the Old Testament, the last verse of the Old Testament speaks a curse. Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I'm going to send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite their lands with a curse. And thus ends the Old Testament. How does the New Testament end? With grace. Verse 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. Because grace is the final word. Father, Father, thank you. What an awesome, wonderful book. What a blessing to all of us. God, help us to heed these things now. We've heard them. We've read them. May we heed them and live them out 
Jesus, we praise you. We understand now, finally, that all prophecy is about you and points to you. And so we lift up the name of Jesus Christ tonight, praising you and thanking you for your death on the cross, your magnificent resurrection, and your wonderful, breathtaking, promised return. And we would join our voices with John as he says, Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.